start with an intro. So I want to welcome all of our students of the Lockheed Martin Leadership Institute and all the different grades to hear one of my favorite people speak. And uh, this is the day that we're unveiling Envision 2040. And it couldn't be more fitting that on the day that we're looking out into the future and unveiling that work that you've done over the last many, many months uh, that we have Jeff Wilcox speak. So Jeff has been a wonderful friend to the Leadership Institute. And I think Jeff and I met probably 10 years ago. Yeah, maybe more, yeah. Yeah, and um, he has been the executive sponsor um, all these years and has spoken on many different topics uh, at the Institute. Um, but it's really special with Envision 2040 because here we have a person who has a really uh, both broad and deep background in technical fields and the issue of complexity and a deep understanding of people. I mean, he's since I've known him, he's been the VP of corporate engineering at Lockheed Martin. He's been the vice president of engineering and operations. He's been a vice president of digital transformation, uh, which had to do with the looking um, how I think to do the best things for the future in their enterprise. He's taught at different universities on subjects like complexity. So who could be more perfect uh, to be with us? And he, he knows the Institute and all of our alums and has had two sons here at Miami. So um, I, I just couldn't be happier that on this special day where we're unveiling, I'm going to say we, it's the students who did all the work, where they are unveiling Envision 2040 that we have you with us. And I am in love with the title of your talk. So with that, I turn it over to you, Jeff. Cool. And I will eventually explain the title of my talk. Um, and yeah, first, congratulations to the team. I know what these kind of efforts take. I did meet with a few of you, I guess, last week and uh, got the link to your website. I guess that was pre-launch. So I got an advanced look and I went through it all in some detail just to read about all the work you've done. And the content is really rich and deep. And I can't imagine the number of hours that were invested in it. And I can tell you that beyond the work you've done, just to sort of meet your requirement, if you will, that work is going to serve you for years, if not decades to come. Not just because of the, you know, sort of the glimpse you've had of what the future might look like, but because of all you've learned about the different vectors of not just technology, but policy and social change and so forth that, that you're addressing. So well done. Um, and I know that's going to be, have been time well spent. You'll come back to one of Louise's alumni events and tell us that that project was uh, formative for you. Can you give me a rough time sense, Louise, just so I know how long, I like to leave questions because I get my favorite questions from these groups, so. Um, uh, well, feel free to take an hour or a little more, whatever works for you. Okay, so I think I'm gonna shoot for like 40 to 45 minutes and then leave uh, the rest of the time for dinner because um, I'm cooking tonight, it's crab cakes. So, um, so I will, I will uh, finish up shortly after six. So let's see, as Louise knows, I tend to ramble when I talk. I don't always have the clearest plan for where I'm going. I kind of want to do three things. Um, one is I want to talk about vision projects in general because you've all just done one. And I've been involved in many in my time, both at Lockheed Martin and before that, um, and not just for work, but you know, for church organizations, community organizations, you'll find no matter where you are, even in your personal life, when I did retirement planning, I retired this January 1st, you have to do some form of visioning the future and thinking about change and how you're going to respond to that. So um, done a lot of them, have a lot of thoughts on them. <clears throat> I sort of jumped to the punchline and say, most of them were not time well spent um, from in, in terms of, of the products that came out of them. And there's a reason for that, which I want to explain in a minute. 
And it's less to do with the content in those efforts, but more to do with the mindset that most groups tend to bring to those efforts, which is sort of more akin to fortune telling really than, than strategic planning. So I'll talk about that. And then I wanna share a vision that I have uh, with you all, um, which is for the future of work. That was what I did at Lockheed Martin towards the end of my time there. I think I touched on this um, at a talk I gave there maybe in 2019, I can't recall. So hopefully it's not repeat for too many of you, but I do want to, that, that work over the last year leading up to my retirement January 1st was my reason for being, spent a lot of time thinking about what I want the future of work to be. And so I want to share that, that vision with you. Uh, and then time permitting, I want to close with um, a little bit about how to go about achieving that vision. And that actually comes from, a, I haven't thought about doing that, but when I met with some of your folks last week, I think it was Rebecca asked me, you know, to sort of talk about how to actually make change. You know, now that you've envisioned change, how do you go about making it? And I realized, oh, I gave a talk on that um, back in 2017, uh, right there to you all. Um, and none of you were there yet, so that will be new material. Um, but it was it was a time when I was thinking a lot about how to how to make change. And so I'll touch on that. I'm going to necessarily kind of be at 50,000 feet because what I just described are really three different talks I've given over the last couple of years, each of them, which was like an hour, and I don't want to rush through it. So I'm not going to go deep. I'm going to just kind of give you a, a framework and then we'll just see where we go. But, um, you know, let me start just with um, strategic planning efforts in general and the challenge I have seen with them. You're always, when you do these, trying to do two things. You know, one is understanding where you are today, understanding the forces of today, the landscape of today, how we got to where we are you know, nascent technologies and nascent social trends and, and all that kind of stuff. So you want to understand where you're at, which I would I'll summarize as kind of wisdom, a knowledge of, of why things are the way they are. And then you want to envision a different future, a better tomorrow. Um, and what I find most people tend to do with these is they treat them as very passive crystal ball fortune teller kind of undertakings um, because it's tempting um, and because it's sort of non-threatening and it's sort of fun. And so I've been in a lot of meetings um, in my time where people would sit around and talk about new technologies and what they're gonna mean to the future. Um, you can't, you know, you can throw a rock and hit a futurist somewhere who's willing to come talk to you for 10 or 20, $30,000. Um, and that's what they do. They basically say, here's what the world's gonna look like. Um, you know, and I say they were not really time well spent for a couple of reasons. One you're gonna be wrong <laughs> just because, and nobody ever goes back and, and shows how they did when they were predicting the future, but kind of universally, you know, you always hear anecdotes about people that predicted a stock market crash or what have you, but they're really just that, they're exceptions that, that prove the rule. Um, and that's, and the other thing is you're going to end up, the reason you do strategic planning is to say, here's the future that we see, and here's what we're gonna do in response. So you cast a vision and then you put a plan together and a roadmap for how you're gonna get there. But you pretty much haven't left the conference room um, before that landscape of today has changed. It doesn't take long before the ground shifts. And then now you're busy, especially in a big company with this you know, cumbersome, brittle you know, plan to get to a place that no longer is relevant. And so that's why I said a lot of those efforts for me were frustrating. Um, I, uh, I did one, which ended up being different. Uh, and it was, um, you know, it was not what I expected it to be. It ended up being, um, we started with, so anyway, in 2015, I was asked to do a vision of 2025 for Lockheed Martin, where I was working at the time. And that was in response to a lot of technological changes, which some people call industry 4.0 or digital transformation, um, what have you, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, robots, all that good stuff. Um, and so, we started by doing that and saying, okay, here's what's gonna happen in the future. And here's how we can use that to meet our mission today. It ended up being very technology focused. But the more you get into it, you know, the more you realize that you're proceeding from a paradigm which might be fundamentally wrong itself. Um, and so what we ended up doing with that was instead of, um, you know, doing all that detailed you know, road mapping and working was casting a vision and telling telling a story. And this was, uh, if you go online and Google Lockheed Martin Future of Work video, you'll find the four or five minute video that we did, which I spent a lot of hours on the script for because it was really important to me to tell this story. And 
this is sort of another lens or mindset to bring to these kind of efforts, which is what world do you want to live in? Which is a different question than what world do you think is going to happen in the future, right? You know, what world do you want to live in? There's infinite possibility in the landscape today. Anything could happen. And you're an agent. You should think of yourself as an agent. That's another challenge I found with these efforts was people think they're predicting something passively and not asking, how can I shape that? You know, I, I am an agent of change. And so this is the world that I want to be. And so we ended up, you know, with this vision and telling the story. Again, I encourage you to watch it because I like it. And I, I think it ended up serving as a great touchstone for our digital transformation program, which I ran the last kind of three or four years at Lockheed Martin. Um, and we still did, after we did that, all of the, you know, we said, okay, this is how we want the world to look. This is how we want to work together. This is how we want to serve our customers. Um, just a long list of different ways we wanted things to be. And then we put plans in place and roadmaps in place and budgets in place to do all that and marched off. Um, and frankly, um, like I said, once in the ground will shift and then all those plans and roadmaps sort of um, can come to naught or not be necessarily time or money well spent. I'm not commenting on that particular effort, just saying in general, but you never, you never lose track of the vision. Um, the vision is your touchstone. So when you describe the future, like you've done with your work here, that becomes your touchstone. So every day you can wake up and say, okay, here's how things are today. Here's the vision of what I wanted tomorrow to be. And let's figure out how to make today better than tomorrow. You know, what's the gap and what can I do today? There is always a temptation to think of this, especially you do a 20 year vision or I did a 10 year vision of thinking this is a big thing that's gonna you know, play out over time. But no, you need to think of every day as being about transformation and every day, how am I gonna move a step closer to that vision, regardless in the sense of what your plans say, if you're willing to, to move away from them. Um, this is where I got that title for, for this you know, talk was from Gibran who wrote uh, The Prophet, his most famous work, a Lebanese American poet. And I like this because the first half of this quote is what so many people will do. You know, and there's many, many examples of people that will take technology and say, okay, now we can do something better um, with that technology. We can go a little faster, but that's all within the same paradigm of what is. So, you know, Henry Ford is famous for saying, although he never said it, that if I'd ask people what they wanted, they would say a faster horse. Um, and so there's lots of examples, you know, from Steve Jobs and others that say, you know, it's not about taking what is and making it a little better. A lot of that happens and a lot of value creation comes from that. A lot of the economy is based on that, but that's not change. You know, that's not transformation. That's not creating a vision for a different tomorrow, which is what I'm hoping you want to do. What you really want to be thinking about is, okay, what will be, and how am I going to get a little bit closer to that? And so we ended up, I used a lot, the, the butterfly as an analogy of transformation. And I like to talk about how, you know, the caterpillar's drive is never to say, boy, I am juicy and I am slow and the birds, you know, have no trouble eating me. Um, that stinks. I think I'm going to, you know, get a little faster or I think I'm going to, you know, get whatever, make, make things a little bit different so the birds don't catch me. And it doesn't say I'm going to progress, I'm going to enhance the what I am and all of a sudden I'm going to you know, fly. I'm just, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to just grow wings. What it literally has to do to transform, and if you look this up on Wikipedia, which I did, it's kind of gruesome. But what happens when that caterpillar forms the chrysalis is it essentially preserves about four different cell groups and the rest of it dissolves and becomes food um, for that transformation to create that butterfly. So, you know, true transformation is like, that's a whole different paradigm. And you can't get from a butterfly, you can't get from a caterpillar to a butterfly incrementally in that sense. You have to pretty much literally die and be reborn. You have to ignore your current paradigm and say, no, I think there's a different way to be. I think you could, I could fly. If I just preserve these particular, you know, cell groups and then, and then you know, go through this transformation process. Um, the challenge of course, is that, you know, nobody, you know, large, large parts of that caterpillar do have to die. And to go through change, nobody wants to um, say, I don't need to exist anymore. One of the hardest parts of organizational change is you'll never find a box on an org chart that says, I don't really need to exist. There's a quote, I'm gonna forget who said it, but you know, the, it's impossible to get a man to um, understand um, something that their salary depends on their not understanding. 
I just sort of butchered that, but I think you get my point. You know, if your whole job in whatever level of whatever company is based on not understanding that what you're doing doesn't really matter or could be, you know, done away with or done differently, you're not going to do it. It's just not human nature for the most part. So, you know, the kind of transformation to a different vision of a different tomorrow is really important and really difficult, and the whole world will fight you on it um, because the whole world is based on a paradigm of today. Um, and it will try to incrementally move forward. Your job as a leader um, is to imagine a different tomorrow. And that's what you've all been doing. Um, and I think that's really cool. Um, so I want to um, kind of progress into um, an example of what I'm talking about. I thought I'd make this kind of tangible if I could. So what's the difference between what is and what could be? Most work, and I'm going to talk about work when I get to my vision, is based on scientific management. If you've heard of this or studied this at all, it goes back to Frederick Taylor. Around the turn of the century, he published this book, which you know all the business magazines will tell you was the most influential management book of all time. And really, all work is structured along these lines, these principles of scientific management, not just in industrials where they make things, because that's what Taylor started out doing, bringing a stopwatch in because he thought there was a lot of inefficiencies and that people at their machines weren't working as hard as they could or as fast as they could. Um, so he set about trying to say, how long should this take and breaking work down into constituent parts and then having a different a management class. I'm not gonna read those, but I encourage you to read them as, as I'm talking um, and a worker class. And that was sort of the beginning of the separation of labor and management, if you will. Um, and so that ended up uh, creating a world and when I talk about my vision for a different tomorrow, which to me is a dehumanized view of work and a dehumanized view of technology. I don't think it's a coincidence and if you research it, you will find a lot of the principles of Taylor's work at the turn of the century came from slavery, came from plantations. It was, it was management principles that plantations owners use. So if you think work has the, of this sort is dehumanizing, it may well be in part based on man's ultimate inhumanity. Um, and so um, this is but in the water, right? This is how big companies um, think. I think in a sense, all companies think. Uh, it's how a lot of engineering is structured, especially system engineering. It's decomposing work into components. You know, so if you're a, you're a mechanical engineer, then you, you're tear down and say you're making an airplane. Well, someone's making the wheels, someone's making the landing gear, someone's making this and the other thing and so forth. You tear it down, you assign it, assign the work, and then you build the work back up. That's all based on scientific management. Um, so that was a that is a dominant paradigm. And I had to come to terms with that and study that and understand that. Because again, that's part of, I said there's two parts to this job, understanding the world that is, and then envisioning the world that you want to be. So I thought, well, has anybody ever challenged that? And well, um, yeah, I don't know if, I, I know you do if you're in computers, because my son uh, is a junior there in the computer science department has been doing Agile, or he did it last semester. So I, I assume some of you are familiar with Agile. Um, Agile is another way to run programs or to run a company or to run development. It started out in software, but it proved to be such a compelling vision that it's now applied to a lot of different things, including management. And again, I won't read those four bullets to you, but I would ask you to sort of read them and contrast them with the last page um, with scientific management. You know, this to me is, is a humanistic view of talent and of, of technology and of the role people can and should play at work. This was 20 years ago. So you're looking 20 years out, right? So not that long ago that Agile was, was formed formed by a very small group of people, maybe 20, um, at a conference in Snowbird, Utah, um, where they got together and, and they basically did a visioning exercise and said, what, what do we think software development should be? Um, and that's where this manifesto comes from. It's a vision. Um, I would, there's a cautionary tale behind it as well, which is now if you go and ask a big consulting company to implement Agile for you, what they have done is forced the Agile philosophy and vision into scientific management as a structure, because that's what everybody knows. And that's really frustrating to see it happen, but it happens you know, all too often, but still the vision's there. And there's a lot of people that use it as a touchstone and come back to it. So I, I share those to compare contrast as the difference between a difference and a way to say that things can, can transform. You know, there's lots of other examples that things can transform. 
And they often start with small groups of people getting together like you did and casting a vision and saying, this is a different future that we believe things should be this way. So uh, with that sort of long introduction, um, like I said, this, I ended up um, spending a lot of time thinking about what I wanted work to be. Didn't start out there, started out thinking about how can new technologies improve the way we do things today? Um, and I want to come back to a point that I missed on the Caterpillar. I said the Caterpillar preserved, you know, three or four cell groups. When you're doing transformation, you also need to preserve your values. And that's why a statement of values is really important when you're doing a vision for the future. Because many things will change, but some things can't change. There have to be some things you believe in, you know, fundamentally. Um, and so for me, uh, in the company I was in, which I have had and have tremendous respect for, um, was for them, it was mission, customer first. If you ever saw the Lockheed Martin commercials of old, they were, we never forget who we're working for. And the second was innovation. So, okay, we can change the way we work and we can still focus while still focusing on the customer, on the mission and innovation, but we can do a much more sort of uh, you know, humanized way of letting everyone bring their full potential to work. That was our goal, to let everyone be able to bring their gifts <clears throat> and contribute their gifts to that mission and to that innovation. So um, ended up, this was a title I used to use when I gave that talk, because everybody's talking about the future of work. If you Google the future of work, you'll get thousands of hits and lots of people, again, willing to give you a talk on it or sell you services more likely on it. I liked these little parentheses because they reminded me that, um, well, I don't really care about, it. I don't believe in this crystal ball of the future of work. I'm like, well, here's what work could be, right? Here's my vision um, for work. And it fell into four categories. And the first was, you know, I believe in a world where leaders are gardeners and not chess masters. Um, and this was an important mindset that we brought to our work. And that I really believe in that the leader's job, and you're in a leadership program, um, I grew up in a leadership mentality of the chess master, which is your people are pieces with different capabilities, like the pawns move certain ways, the rooks move certain ways, the knight moves certain ways. They have certain skill sets and you know, certain responsibilities, and there's a very strict sort of way of how you move forward. Um, but um, you know, over time, I came to realize, again, that's really dehumanized, right? That's how do you use people to achieve your ends. I like to, I, my hope, my vision for the future is that leaders are responsible for creating an environment where people can thrive, or in this example, a garden will thrive. Um, and so that's a whole different way of working, right? You don't come to work with a plan and a sort of a set of things you're going to do and people you're going to do them with. Just like the gardener comes out in the morning and says, wow, okay, rained a lot last night, or wow, the deer ate my plants last night, or wow, this weed has taken over this you know, part of my garden. Those things happen. Some days it's sunny, some days it's not. Um, and so you come out every day and you say, okay, well, I have a vision, right? That's back to the touchstone of what I want my garden to be. Um, and well, how am I gonna make tomorrow closer to that vision than today? And how you're gonna do that really depends on the current state. It depends on what's been happening. Um, and so that's more of the mindset I'd encourage you as you go into your leadership career. And I always like to pause and say, and I, I learned this over my years of involvement with leadership programs is never think that you're in a leadership program to learn to lead in the future. You're in a leadership program to learn how to lead today. Um, and that might be a, a small group um, at school. That might be something in your community. It might be something in your family. It might be something you know at a job, um, but it's not about the future. It's about leading today. And this had a number of sort of subcomponents I won't go into in great detail, but again, this was an hour long talk that I used to give, but it's really about expecting that change and traditional management leadership doesn't really expect change. Um, but change, as I said earlier, when you cast a vision, it's gonna change, the world's gonna change around you. Expect it and more than expect it, love it, embrace it, thrive in it and say, wow, I'm getting way more sun than I thought, you know, maybe I can, you know, plant this type of plant. I'm going to get some tropicals or plant a banana tree because it's sunny this summer. Um, so, you know, thrive in that change um, and use it to build towards your vision. Um, spend a lot of time thinking about protecting people. You know, weeds are the equivalent of bad actors in an organization. You know, there are always people that are, for whatever reason, you know, just abusive in some way or, you know, um, 
too arrogant to contribute, don't listen, things like that. You have to move those people out and you have to just remove them like weeds in a garden, not to be callous, but um, a lot of this to me was about communication, which is something I've talked about a lot at Miami and, and other places. And the thing I like to talk about here is the importance of transformational listening for the leader. And I, and I stole this from a podcast and I wish I could remember the name of the woman that was the psychologist that was speaking on it, but she's an expert in communication. And she described three types of communication levels. And the first is reflective, um, which is, well, the first is transactional, which is what most listening done by leaders, unfortunately, is. You go into a meeting, somebody tells you a briefing or a situation with some part of something, um, and you listen to it and you evaluate it and you say, you're right, you're wrong, okay, I'll, whatever, and you sort of evaluate the conversation. The other is reflective, which is better. You know, you kind of sit back and think, that's interesting. You're making me think of something here. And now that I understand that, I'm going to reflect on it and I'm going to move forward in a different way. Some call it active listening. That's good, better. The best, she said, is something called transformational listening, which is as you're having this conversation, what's the third way? You know, how do you get one and one to equal more than one? How can you engage with this person to say, I heard you say that, that made me think this, what do you think about the other thing? And then together you create shared value between you and create something even larger. Um, I love that concept. And the last, which again, we can talk about a lot is the importance of diversity to this. Just like in a garden, you know, you need diversity to thrive in that vision. You know, as uh, Louise mentioned, I teach, one of the classes I taught right before the pandemic was in systems thinking at Georgetown. And one of the tenets of systems thinking, which is really how to move a complex system forward, how to make tomorrow better than today, um, is you need a diversity of voices and a wide array of lenses and mindsets on a problem to adequately see it and address it and move it forward. I was thrilled to see you all in your 2040 work are talking about diversity and equity and inclusion. Because um, you know, too often that ends up being kind of a compliance or a do the do the right thing um, conversation. I'm not saying those don't need to be done, and not enough. Wow, we have this this huge array of gifts and talent, and yeah, people come from different backgrounds and bring a different way of thinking to this, and that's great. And we need to create an environment where that can be great and used and come together to create something larger. So that was my first dream, you know, here is that leaders in the future will be gardeners, not chess masters. The other is you'll find too often, you've probably seen this at school. I saw it certainly when I was in school, is that people, you know, too often um, think about knowledge as power. This is a bigger issue in my generation, I think, than in yours, which is sort of brought up with more, you know, um, you know, sharing as a mindset. But you know, typically knowledge is power and people hold on to information and they decide who they're gonna give it to and at what time and in what format. And so you know, we sort of focused as our dream, our vision on what we call working in public or defaulting to open. And instead of saying, okay, I've got this piece of information, I need to convey it, who needs to know it? And I will invite them to a meeting or send them an email, say no, say, okay, is, is there any reason everybody shouldn't know this? You know, should I just not put this out? Um, and should I, um, whether it's, you know, using technology like Box instead of, you know, a file sharing system that only certain people have access to, um, this pushes back also against the conventional paradigm of controlling the flow of information, which is very much Taylorism and scientific management. Um, an example I like to use that I did sort of pushing back and changing the paradigm was I used to write job descriptions for directors, which is the level below a vice president. And that's always been kind of done very carefully and sort of, you know, for, and again, for a lot of good reasons tied to compliance, but kept separate when the job description is written. But I'm like, well, who knows better what this job description should be than the people this director is going to lead. <laughs> and so I open sourced it um, with the team. I said, okay, you're going to have a new director. You know, what do you think this job is? Do you think they should know? And they basically crowdsourced a job description. And that might sound obvious to you, but it's not done very often. Um, so this whole concept of need to know uh, is different than need to share. Um, and everyone should work in public. Technology is letting you do this. We love Slack, um, love asynchronous channels and communications. Um, so a lot of forward progress in that regard. Making work visible is huge, we believe. As part of this vision that it should be clear what people are working on and what work needs to be done. You know, too often work is assigned sort of again in buckets and not 
you know, kind of broadly visible to everybody. But the beauty of making work visible is anybody can contribute to any project. It's not Taylorism where it's broken down and you're assigned a certain project. You show up at the Monday action meeting, we call them, and you say, oh, I see you're in charge of the new, you know, communications on such and such. I, I love communications and I've got some extra time. Can I help you? Um, and lots of that would happen in those environments. So that's great. Kind of repeating myself there, getting out of email. <coughs> Working asynchronously, you get more and more buzz in that um, about the vision for the future. Most companies move work forward through meetings, um, but that's synchronous, right? It's when you can schedule a meeting. Um, but working asynchronously means you're always in these environments, again, like Slack or Box, and you're always able to post what you need. And then and this is important, became very important in the pandemic, became very important with global operations. Um, and kind of lastly, the belief that work, that data is a strategic asset. Um, and you need to think about your data as everybody's data in that organization um, and structure it and share it accordingly. So. Um, all that is some kind of nitty gritty around this big general notion of working in public and not every sharing what you're doing. Um, people are afraid to do that too often, but that's how we all can work together more effectively. Um, the other part of my dream and vision was um, you'll find a system. Uh, I like this quote, work on the system, not in the system, because um, the system is the paradigm you're in. A system is created based on a paradigm. We teach that in systems thinking. Um, so the system you're in by definition is tied to an old existing paradigm. And so if you're working on it, I mean, if you're working in it, then you're working, you're not working towards your vision, you're working towards a vision somebody else established sometime uh, in the past. So um, always focusing on the end process, like in this picture, if your mission is you know, food distribution or disaster relief or helping orphans or what have you, you know, it's easy to forget that's your mission and think, no, you know, my job is to serve the finance arm of this organization and to do what the finance arm needs or the, the people that write the letters for fundraising or what have you. Um, no, that, that picture, that is your mission. Uh, and you need to always keep that front in mind. Um, it's easy to lose track of, but that was, Part of this this vision always focusing on the end and always focusing uh, on the customer and then um, you know finally and this is really part of agile and this goes back to what i said at the top um, of the of the half hour which was um, you know too often we cast a vision and then build a plan around it and then march forward in that plan um, but never pause to think about it um, and like I said, the world's changing around you. Building in time for reflection is huge, both in your life um, and in your work. And so we love this vision of a place where people experiment um, things that are, we call them safe to fail, um, try stuff and see what works. Um, but then most importantly, you can't just do that. Then you have to build in time to reflect. And what we found was, um, and, and I had great support and a great um, company and, and leadership that let me do this, but in most places, the very first meeting that gets canceled when things get busy are the retrospective meeting um, because it doesn't feel like you're moving work forward. And so um, it's easy to get those canceled. So we always made sure, no, this is important. I know this doesn't seem like we're doing work on the work, but we're talking about what happened last quarter or last month and the stuff we tried. And do we like it? Should we do more of it? Should we do less of it? Um, so this notion of experimenting and trying stuff um, when you're building towards a future vision and you don't like there's no roadmap to get there, right? The only way you can do it is to try stuff and then um, small stuff that's again safe to fail and then see if it moves you towards your vision or not. If it doesn't throw it away, if it does, try more of that. Um, talked about building time into calendars and again, always keeping your eye on the vision um, and that touchstone um, and not get caught up in the planning and the execution. Um, mode. So um, that was, I wanted to share, because you just did a 2040 vision, I wanted to share what our 2025 vision was. Um, and just as a way of saying, you know, um, I wanted that to challenge an existing paradigm, which was Taylorism and scientific management, because I believe we can move towards a more humanized view of work. I think this fourth industrial revolution or whatever you wanna call it, this world of data as a strategic asset that we're in 
like any technology can do one of two things. It can humanize or dehumanize. Um, and you read lots of in the, uh, stuff in the paper. You don't have to look far to look at technology like artificial intelligence being used to dehumanize. Um, but it's all got the potential to also bring us towards a more human, a humanized approach to work. And so that's my vision. So I just wanted to, to share that. I wanted to close with uh, a section. This was a talk again I gave in 2017. And I actually, <clears throat> I don't usually write down talks, but I wrote that one out. And so I'm happy to send it to you and you can see the whole hour and the charts that were <coughs> behind it. But, you know, I said at the top of the, um, uh, the, this, this time together um, that where you've been so far is basically two things, whether you did it consciously or not. You've said, okay, where are we today? What's the landscape of today? What are the forces acting today? And what do we want tomorrow to look like? So I call those wisdom. Um, I think wisdom is a knowledge of how the world works today and then vision. Um, but that doesn't get you to change, right? Or transformation. Having done that, then you have to, I want to talk about two other things. One is your voice and then the other is, is courage briefly. <coughs> We've already talked about vision, so I don't want to belabor it, but you can cultivate, you know, vision. Um, and why it's hard is because you're, again, you're trapped in a current paradigm and you have to shake yourself out of it. Like I say here, shake things up. And, and I've read a number of books on how to do this. I remember one called A Whack on the Side of the Head, which gave you ideas for how to just think, think differently. The one I'll, I remember because I did it and it works is take a different route to work. If you're driving to work back when people used to drive to work, um, you see different things, you think different things. It's amazing what a small change like that can, can really do. You know, lots of other ways to um, just sort of, um, sort of shake up how you see the world and what the world could be. There is nothing better for this, no better touchstone than the arts, um, than poetry, than reading, than plays, than paintings. You know, that's where the world of possibility is fully expanded on, is fully available to you. Um, it's always a challenge with engineering, especially where you are in your career, because you're busy with, you know, all your required courses and, and I get that. And so, you know, time, although I love that Miami does focus on a liberal education and I'm sure you've had some classes in jazz or what have you. Um, so that's great. But, you know, as you graduate and sort of go into hopefully, a, I won't say a calmer time of life, but a time of life when you have space to, to do this kind of thing, exploring the arts, you know, I, I, I've been learning jazz piano for five years, um, photography, things like that. It just gets you out of this framework of the way things have always been. And the pandemic has been brutal for routine. And routine, again, is just, is just the paradigm, the dominant paradigm. So shaking that up is a great way to, to, to get a vision and establish a vision. The last bullet is <clears throat> sort of a plea not to spend so much time marinating in other people's ideas. It, Twitter's great to a point. Um, and reading and TED Talks and all that stuff is great. It can, it can prompt ideas, but there is a whole marketplace of people who do nothing but thought leadership. I put that in quotes. And you can spend all your time reading about them and listening to them, <clears throat> um, but those are their ideas. That's their vision for the future. Um, not saying it's not good, might be, might not be, but it can take up way too much of your time. And worse than that, it can constrict your own thinking. Time alone, you know, Louise and I talk about this a lot and I've talked about this in other talks, just time alone and stillness. I know you have precious little of it, um, but there's a great essay you can find online called Solitude and Leadership in the American uh, Spectator. Uh, I might've got that wrong, but that's the name of the article, Solitude and Leadership um, by William Dershowitz. It talks about this, the importance of solitude and he, and he defines solitude not necessarily being alone but having coffee with a friend um, so there's other ways to you know sort of be alone with your thoughts but this is a risk in an always on 24 7 media society you can easily marinate in other people's you know thoughts um, so we already talked about vision i just want to touch on it again you know wisdom is knowing how things are and when I gave this talk, these were some of I, what I did was I didn't have a good working definition of wisdom. So I made a list of all the wise people that I knew. Um, it was a long list. I'm blessed that it was such a long list. 
Um, and I said, what are their common traits? And, and actually, interestingly, when I first made that list, the title at the top of the page was um, things wise people never do. So I kind of did it in the background. And then once I did that, uh, I flipped it around. Um, and these were the things that I came up with. Um, you know, first, if you want to acquire wisdom, which again is the knowledge of how things work. And my biggest frustration in my time in my career was I had so many people come, up, come into my office and say, they have a vision for a different thing. They think something different should be happening. And but they have no idea why things are the way they are. Um, and so I try to help them with that. But a lot of people just don't want to think about that. They want to untether from the way things are. Um, and you really can't, you know, it's not capitulation to say, okay, this is where I am. You know, this is what I got. And I'm going to understand that as I think about my vision. Um, there's nothing probably more important. It might be an overstatement, but maybe not that to think about than what you pay attention to. I keep a long list of quotes from people like Mary Oliver, um, and Susan Sontag, and and a bunch of other ones about the importance of paying attention because what you choose to pay attention to, I have one quote that says, show me what you pay attention to and I'll show you who you are. And I believe that's true. And I'll show you what you love or who you love. Um, what you choose to pay attention to, it's your one commodity that you only got so much of. Um, and so, and I like, if you think about how we have in English described that word, pay attention, you do have to pay, it costs, you know, you're doling out attention, it doesn't come back, uh, it costs you something, you know, that's why there's nothing more you can do for, you know, a spouse or a friend than pay attention, someone you care about, because that's, you know, nothing more valuable you have, um, but that's also how you become wise, is by paying attention to the world around you, um, being curious, asking questions kind of goes without saying. Einstein said, I have no special gifts, except I am passionately curious. I'm not quite sure if that wasn't false modesty, but, um, <clears throat> you know, and you know that just from making small talk and getting to know people, asking questions, being curious. Um, I've said there before in talks that we had a rule in my kids were literally little, you couldn't leave the table until you asked three questions um, because it's just being curious is a source of wisdom. It's how you learn, care. Um, ask. Talk again about stillness as, as part of wisdom, because um, that's when it comes to you. Um, you have to sit back and listen. When I made this list of people who were wise to me, you know, those were some of the things I thought about. They're very still. They're not fidgeting. They're not looking at their phones. They're paying attention to me. And they have an economy of movement. You see this with successful people and wise people, um, especially, you know, it's, it's just obvious when you're in a giving a briefing, you know, who is still and who is, you know, not fidgeting because they're not paying attention to loop back to that. The other thing I said uh, when I was thinking about the wise people I know is they're all optimists in different ways. I never met a wise curmudgeon. I don't think there is such a thing um, because, you know, wise people understand that there's tremendous potentiality in the world, that anything can be done, anything can happen, um, and they're hopeful. Um, and they convey that hopefulness to you. So there's ways to cultivate wisdom and I'd encourage you all to do that as you look to change the world. So you kind of, as part of your Envision 2040 effort talked about um, wisdom and vision because you had to figure out where things are, that's wisdom and where you wanna go, that's vision. Um, the two other components to making change I, I listed as voice and courage because you can have everything I just described but if you're not willing to stand up um, and tell that story, cast that vision, it isn't gonna matter. It's gonna die in your head. You know, it might be a beautiful vision. It might have been a great vision. You gotta be willing to stand up there and talk about it. Um, and it's really hard, which is why courage is, is the final one um, because the world will fight against your efforts to change it and its dominant paradigm. Um, and so, you know, you just have to understand that this is gonna be hard, but you have to get up, you have to um, you know, be willing to stand. Sorry, my dog just poked his head in my door. Um, learning to write is huge. Writing has become a bigger and bigger thing. You know, Amazon has sort of made this um, part of how they work. You write a four or five page uh, memo at Amazon before you sit down and even talk about it. They have what are called silent meetings. 
you come in, you present your case in writing, you know, and this is a big Jeff Bezos thing. He said some of them are poetry and some of them are lousy, but you know, people have to write. Um, and so learning how to write concisely is, is really important. Please spend time on it. You know, I spend, if I'm writing a paragraph to the CEO, which I've only done a couple of times, it's probably a three or four effort par a paragraph, a three or four hour paragraph. It's just, it takes that long to keep reading every sentence and make sure it's saying what you want it to say. Um, so writing is a big deal. The way you learn to write well is to read. Um, I worry it's becoming a lost art. Hopefully not. Hopefully you're all readers beyond just sort of what you have to read. Uh, maybe this summer you'll have some downtime to, to do some reading, um, but that's critical. Uh, presenting, as I said, you'll have lots of opportunities. I know you have this. One of the great things about your program, as Louise has architected it, is I know you get lots of opportunities to, to present. And please take them all seriously as chances to learn um, and get better. And all of that really comes down to vulnerability. Doing this effectively is a willingness to be known. Um, and um, now my dog is in my office. So. I would let you guys say hi. Okay. Um, hey, Darwin. Okay. Good. Hey, Han. There he goes. Nobody's out there. Um, all of this effective presentation is risky and requires a willingness to be known and a willingness to be vulnerable. Um, and that's really, really hard. Uh, and again, last uh, is courage. I'm going to close my door before he comes back. And I don't want to belabor this um, except to say another, if my kids will tell you one thing I've said since they were born, it's the old Woody Allen quote, which also he didn't say, like Henry Ford, but um, is that 80% of life is showing up. It's hard showing up, you know, like the gardener thing. I'll use that metaphor as a, as a sort of figuratively and not literally. It's hard to walk out in the morning and see what happened and, and say, okay, wow, I have to show up and figure out now how I'm going to make tomorrow better than today. It's noble work to live, just to show up and try <laughs> and just to be there. You'd be surprised how many people just don't, just don't show up. So I think courage is largely about being willing to show up and say, I care about this vision and I want to convince you of it. And together we're gonna try to, try to move forward. Uh, last thing I wanted to do and I'll take questions. This was a whole nother talk I gave. I think, I know Louise has seen this talk a couple of times, so I just want to touch on it. And I want to shift as I end from, again, this conversation about change and leadership and moving towards a vision, it's very tempting and easy to think it's a tomorrow thing, that it's like a five or 10 or 20 year thing. But what I want you to think about is no, it is a, you know, it's a six o'clock on a Tuesday thing. Um, and that's why I like the word posture. It's what posture are you going to bring to your day? Um, and the things I like to talk about with posture, uh, and again, this is a whole talk, but which I gave, I think, there at Miami as well, which is a sense of humor. You know, a sense of humor is important, you know, because you don't know what you're going to face, you know, in a given day. It's also important because humor is what punctures sanctimony and it, which is, again, that predominant paradigm. The best of, um, of humor and of irony and, um, you know, is, is poking fun at power and saying this established power structure is absurd. Nobody wants to say that inside an established power structure. But a sense of humor, again, done productively is really powerful. My mentor, hero, Norm Augustine, who was CEO of Lockheed Martin for a while, is one of the funniest people you will ever meet. Uh, takes what he does very seriously does not take himself very seriously and is always willing to sort of, he wrote a book called Augustine's Laws, highly recommended for, I read it as a young manager long before I had the honor of meeting Norm. Um, but it's basically um, just a, a walkthrough of, what does he call it? Um, corporate misadventures. Um, and uh, it's just, it's important to keep that sense of humor. And to keep that sense of wonder, because that's how you're going to keep your eye on, on your vision and understand the potentiality in today and to, to think about that future. And then also, as you go through your day, to think about a sense of gratitude, because it's easy when you do these things and think about, OK, you know, I did this work and here's this vision and and here's you know my understanding of where we are today. And that's my chapter. And that's all there is to it. 
But no, your chapter is in the middle of a big book. You know, you're part of a long story. You know, somebody passed a baton to you. Could have been parents, could have been a teacher, whoever, you know, founders of Miami University um, who built your program. You're part of a much longer story. And when you're done, you'll pass it on to somebody else. You'll pass that baton to somebody else. And so keeping that sense of gratitude is really important. You can actually see my office behind me, those except for the Wright brothers or pictures of my uh, grandparents, both my grandfathers who worked for IBM uh, and my dad. Um, and I, it's there as a reminder to me that I'm part of a, I'm part of a longer story. Um, and so um, that's a way it's, it's humbling, which is good. Um, it also puts into perspective what you can and can't do. And it also reminds you that, you know, the thing about visions is you never get there. That's okay. It's meant to be aspirational. It's meant to say, um, this is um, what I'm going to look at my day with an eye towards what I want my day to be. And then I'm going to fail. And then I'm going to get up and then I'm going to do it again. Um, it's a nice reminder if you think of where you come from um, and who you owe for where you are to maintain that sense of, of gratitude. And just to drive home this notion of um, it's really about today um, is these couple of quotes that I like. I have lots of quotes on this as well. Uh, if you're interested, it's sort of an interesting, um, there's a great video, um, it's actually an audio, but it's on YouTube, which is um, a commencement talk given by David Foster Wallace and it's called, This is Water. And it's really all about reminding you that this is your life right now at, at 5.55 <coughs> on a Tuesday. Um, it's not something that's going to happen in the future. So as you do a, as you do a vision um, and build plans towards it, um, remember life is what's going to happen while you're busy thinking about those plans. So enjoy it and immerse yourself in it and don't lose sight of that. Um, that's it. Um, talked a little longer than I wanted to, but yeah, we have 10 or 15 minutes or I'm happy to stay longer if you want. The crab cakes can wait. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think I'm just going to stop there and hear what's on your mind. Well, Jeff, that was amazing. Um, every single time you talk with us or when you and I perhaps share a beverage together. It's always, always uh, insightful and makes me think kind of deep inside. So. Uh, nice, thank you. Uh, so thank you and I open it up um, if uh, anyone has any questions. Yeah, I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, first, thank you very much for meeting with us. Um, I've learned a lot and I hope everybody else has too. Um, so what I had to ask was, you said that asking questions that are important and how like, you should always ask a grouping of questions a day. What series or question would you say you find yourself asking a lot and that is that question the most important? I don't tend to think about the importance of a question because I, I kind of view it as, I'm going to come at this circularly, um, is so I have a radar background. And then radar, the way radars work is they send out a pulse, then it hits the target, and then it comes back, um, and then you send it from another angle, and you kind of keep doing that until you build up kind of a picture of the target because you don't know what, what that thing is. I kind of view questions in the same way. You know, especially if you're talking to people <clears throat> and you want to understand them, and the first thing I keep in mind is you don't understand them, right? You don't, you know, really understand them or what they're thinking at the time. And so it's really important to give open-ended questions and give people space to, um, to come forward with that. So when I was in that mode or when I'm in it now with friends, <clears throat> unfortunately less during a pandemic and it's never quite the same over, over the video is, um, you know, trying to move past, um, you know, questions in a vein of um, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, you know, people tend to sort of 
not be thinking about the big picture. They're, they're thinking about, okay, should I change my job or not? Or should I you know, do whatever or not? And so the question, a great question to ask them is always, well, what are you looking to accomplish you know, with this change? What does that look like to you? To help them think about why they're doing it in the first place. I guess questions should all be in the why space because um, why is kind of a big question. You know, so for example, I would ask you, <clears throat> I didn't do this last week with, with you, Taylor, your team, but I would ask you, why are you doing this assignment? Um, I don't know if um, you probably would have had four different answers. We talked to four people. Um, when I taught systems thinking, um, I was doing homework the same way every week. Everybody got the same assignment. Everybody, everybody had different assignment because it was based on a project they cared about. But my trouble was I couldn't really compare people in any sense. And the system wanted me to be able to grade people or to sort of understand if people understood it. So one day I gave everyone the same homework. And then I asked them, I said, do you know why I gave you all the same homework? And nobody had ever thought about that. Another question I asked them was, why does this class exist? Okay, why does this? Well, I mean, I would like, I would ask you to think, why does the Leadership Institute exist? That's an important question that you probably never thought about. Um, why is it important? Because that's why it's here today. And there are forces that put it there and those forces are gonna matter in its future. You know, so when I asked my students, you know, why is this class here? You know, uh, or maybe I phrased it, why are you in this class? Or you know, I said, why do you think this class exists? There were lots of different answers. You know, why did the Dean create this class? Why did I agree to teach this class when I had a full-time job? I had a reason. Um, why, the Dean had a reason, the university had a reason. <clears throat> um, and they were all different. And the example I was trying to share was it's important to get the sort of broad perspective of why something exists. But I, would, I think the most important questions are always the why, why is something, you know, the way it is. Um, that's the best way to learn um, and to think about where you're at. You know, that felt kind of muddy, but. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I like to wait and I'm really comfortable with silence. So. <laughs> um, wait, can I just speak up? I know Karen put the thing in there, but. Yeah. Sorry, didn't look at the chat. Go, go right ahead, Ethan. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I just didn't want to misspeak. Uh, I also want to say thanks for talking because I remember a couple years ago when you spoke in um, the Farmer Business School. It's really good, really good again this year. So thanks. Thank um, I kind of I I have no idea if this question is going to come out clear, so uh, please bear with me. But um, it's kind of like kind of a little bit off of uh, what Tate was saying um, about asking questions, but kind of combining like the curiosity with the uh, like with the transformational listening. Um, and let's see, did you say something about, you know, asking towards, no, it was somewhere else. Kind of like the curious questions, maybe we should be asking people to, um, to like foster that, like transformational listening, like speaking to like factual or more emotional stuff. Um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Can you sort of help me with that last part of that, um, asking questions that draw out the more, were you saying emotional stuff or? Um, no, I guess I was kind of just giving like examples maybe of things that we would ask. I, yeah, maybe I could have excluded that part, but just kind of like a, as far as transformational listening go right. with asking questions, you know, should we be leaning more towards like a humanized kind of question based stuff? I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay, I hear that. That's good. Um, yeah, you definitely should, because if you want to create a third thing, which is different than what the first person said or what you heard or what you asked back, um, um, understanding motivation is really important. Um, and so I'm trying to think of an example of a transformational listening. The best ones come out with nothing like you went into them with, um, not what you intended to have in that particular conversation. Um, and they're usually because somebody had 
um, somebody made an assumption that wasn't necessarily one they had to make. Um, you know, they would ask, okay, um, here's what I think we should do. We should build a factory here. An evaluative listing would say, okay, you did make the case, you didn't make the case, whatever. And I might say, oh, that's interesting. You made me think um, about what the factory should make. I'm making all this up, obviously. Um, and then that would be kind of reflective and active listening. And then the third thing tends to be more like, well, that person assumed we needed a factory because of some assumption in our market research. Um, but we made a big assumption and didn't realize it. The best transformational listening results in realizing there was an assumption made that didn't need to be made or wasn't really relevant to um, what you were actually talking about. You just didn't know you brought that into the room. Um, and so questions that point that out, like, why do we have to do that? Um, I feel like I have a better examples on the tip of my tongue, but, um, but yeah, they end up just being a whole other thing happens and it's really powerful and you end up going in a whole different direction. And again, it's usually because both of you came into the room with an assumption <clears throat> um, and that assumption didn't necessarily, wasn't that important. You know, you didn't realize it wasn't important but it turned out it wasn't. Um, if I sat here for five minutes, I could think of better examples. <laughs> I won't do that to you. No, no, I, I think that was, I think it was good. I, I think I'm catching where you're going with it. Cool, thank you. Uh, Madison has a question. Go ahead, Madison. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can, Madison, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, my question's kind of a tangent, but I would like to know, can you tell me about an experience that will stick with you forever? And it can be leadership related or it can be literally just anything. Probably the best way to answer that is to tell you what came into my head when you asked it. <laughs> because that was clearly something that stuck with me forever. Um, and for some reason, I was just telling my son about this. Um, and it was not surprisingly a failure. Um, you know, I got asked once, you get asked a lot, you know, what were your failures and what did you learn from them? Which is interesting. Um, somebody asked me once, what were your successes and what did you learn from them? And I was stunned to realize I didn't learn anything from my successes um, because they're fleeting and the ground has shifted and there's a new mountain to climb, but that's not your question. So um, what stuck with me forever, the experience was very early on in my career. I would have been in my late twenties um, and I was given the responsibility for a test out in Hawaii great thing to do in your late 20s before you have kids and it's just a nice place to be on an island in, in, in Kauai. Um, and as part of this project, um, I had was responsible for the building of this 90 foot long, called a spar buoy, basically just think of a long tower sort of structure. And at the top was an antenna and the idea is you put it in the water and because it's so long, it won't bob around much and then the antenna's there and we could do this experiment. Well, you know, to test it, we had to lift it up a little bit because you can't talk to antennas on the ground and the, where we were working in the frequency. So um, we lifted it up with a forklift. I wasn't there, I was 1500 feet higher on a cliff about an hour away. And all of a sudden the signal went out. And then I called down by the walkie talkie and they said that um, the buoy had broke. Um, they had lifted it up and then it was on a forklift and then the forklift, nobody saw it, but gradually the rope that was holding it up slipped snapped, broke my life right there in pieces. <laughs> and I will never forget that 45 minute drive down the mountain. Um, and also we'll never forget that James Taylor was on saying sweet dreams and flying machines in pieces on the ground. Literally that song playing as I'm driving down the mountain. Um, and so I, I'm looking at it and I'm walking around it. And that was the most formative experience of my career to date. Yeah, I'm almost tempted to say of my career, oddly. Um, but the reason it was, wasn't because of that failure, because stuff happens, right? Um, it was the realization that I'm walking around it and then the guy that built it said, what are you thinking? You look pensive. I said, well, I'm thinking if I could just get a couple hours of data then this project will have been worth it and then we can go fix it and come back for three months because the plan was to come back for three months to get all kinds of weather conditions. And that was nice to have, but not necessary to have. And so he said, well, if that's true, then take the part that didn't break, stick the antenna on top, it's only 60 feet, but it'll get you something and fly it out there by helicopter. And we did it. 
And we took two hours of data and we proved what we needed to prove. And then we all went out to dinner. Then we sent the buoy back to Florida to get fixed and did work, did our six month uh, experiment. But what I learned from that was to be able to rethink, it's back to rethinking assumptions. I thought I needed 90 days in the water to do this. I didn't, that's nice to have. I needed a couple hours of data. And so the lesson I took from that, and that I, I just answered the first thing that popped in the, my head when you said one that stuck with me was um, always be willing to, those are called value traps, by the way. And there's a whole, if you've ever read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, they talk about different traps. And I teach these traps in my systems thinking. There's a whole lecture just on different mental traps. Um, there's one called the, uh, I forget the full name, but it's a monkey trap. And what they do if I want to catch monkeys is you take a coconut and you drill a hole um, and you put food in there like uh, something big. And the monkey will reach in and you chain that coconut to the tree. And the monkey will reach in and grab that piece of food. And then you can come get the monkey because he can't get it out because his fist is clenched. He never thinks it's more important to me to drop this food and not get caught than to get killed. That's a value trap. You're like, that's what I came to do and that's what I'm gonna do. You'll find, I've had a lot of value traps in my life. Um, you know, having friends, my wife is great at pointing out to me, well, that's a value, that's what called a value trap, but that, that's a value trap. The thing you think you need isn't really what you need. The thing you think is important isn't really important. Something else was important. Anyway, that's what came to my head when you asked something that stuck in my mind. Thank you. Yeah. Audrey, I think you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, hello. I was just wondering, um, because I found your information about um, like scientific and agile management very interesting. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about um, what trends you've seen there in your personal line of work um, throughout your career. And if there were any ways you'd suggest that we could apply um, those higher level theories um, to our everyday lives or our school lives. Um, yeah, there's a lot of practices which will um, help you move in that direction. Um, and again, <laughs> I can point you to some resources that would take too long to share here. But when I gave this as an hour long talk, I talked about them. But I'll share one, which is it's really important how you meet, how you come together. And in terms of getting everyone's voice in the room. And so we would do what are called action meetings. And they always start with an opening round. I meant to do it today and I totally forgot because you can do it in the chat window as well, which is a question like, it's you think of them as icebreakers if you've been in groups that do icebreakers, but they're like, um, oh, if you could have dinner anywhere in the world tonight, where would it be? Um, or if you could have a skill like, you know, acquire a skill right now with no effort, what would that skill be? Stuff like that. And it's partly to get to know each other, but there's a more subtle goal, which is there's science that shows if people speak early in the meeting, they're willing to speak later in the meeting. And so to move in that direction, I'd encourage you to think about that. I think an opening round, and you know, you must have you know, school groups or you know, back home, different types of groups or even family gatherings. So my son and I um, have started a family business sort of, which is basically just my um, a little bit of consulting. He does all the, the business management of it, but we have weekly meetings and they're action meetings. It's the two of us, not a lot going on, um, but we have a, a Trello board, which is our, our workflow. We do an opening round, we do a closing round. Um, so there's real simple practices which can open the door to much more participatory engagement. And again, you can do it anywhere in life, but the default mode is always there's a leader and they are telling people what to do or asking people what they've done. Um, if you've worked in an, as an intern in any decent sized company or larger, larger company and been to a staff meeting, that's what they are. There's the leader at the head of the table and they go around and say, okay, what did you do? What did you do? And then they assign work. That's scientific management. But we had much you know, more effective and participatory meetings um, doing action meetings. So, and again, happy to send links along. Um, the book we took all that from was called uh, Brave New Work by a guy named Aaron Dignan. And I liked it so much, I brought him in as a consultant and we ended up with two full-time people from his company called The Ready um, as consultants. <coughs> and 
he has all that in the book and talks about ways to move things forward. So I'd highly recommend Brave New Work to get you thinking about that. And they got a great podcast. So if you're on a walk and just want to listen, the Brave New Work podcast is super. I had to listen to it this morning. Excellent. I'll check that out. Thank you so much. Yep. And I believe Asia, you had a question. Yes, thank you. So um, I know that in our class, we've talked a lot about, and I know you talked a lot about the importance in being a leader of understanding um, the people on your team's motivations and how to inspire them to be their best. So my question is, how? what are the best ways to understand what people's motivations are and how do you use that to inspire them? I'm trying to not give you a kind of a trite answer, but the true answer, you know, there's no shortcut to getting to know people and it doesn't really happen in the day-to-day -day of work. You know, it happens, you know, over dinners or, you know, coffee. Um, I mean, you, you can do make some progress at work, but it's like any other way to really get to know somebody. It is, um, you know, why, why are you here? You know, what makes you tick? What are you interested in? What are you passionate about? Um, and I always made an effort to, you know, I would literally do day trip. I did a day trip to Denver once to do a 45 minute meeting with somebody. I did a day trip to, to Dallas to have dinner with a guy just because he, you know, he was important for me to learn from. Um, there's, and again, once we get past the pandemic or some, to some extent, there's a whole other conversation about the effectiveness of, of Zoom as technology. And it's better than nothing. <laughs> and it's better than audio conferencing. But I think we would all agree it leaves a lot to be desired from an interaction of really getting to know somebody. So if hopefully, eventually we get back to, to in person. I'm trying to give you a more structured answer. Um, everybody wants different things from work. You know, you will see everything from hey, I just want to show up from nine to five and get a paycheck every Friday. And then I'm passionate about mountain biking and that's, that's what I want to do. You know, and so that's great. And it's good to know that because then you know they're fine to just be um, sort of chunking out work. Um, and then other people who say, yeah, I'm doing this, but I'm really passionate about, um, you know, this other thing. I had somebody early in my career who was, working in security, <coughs> doing sort of a lot of filing, basically, of classified papers. And this was before computer networking, really. Computers were in, but they were just starting to be networked with, with cables. And uh, he said, I want to get into computers. And long story short, everybody wanted to get into computers, but he's the only one that I let do it because he did his current job well, but he wanted more. And Long story short, he ended up being the head of the IT group. That this is back at SAIC, you know, down the road. And what's my point? Um, yeah, I think it's just what motivates people. What um, a lot of good questions you can ask. Just like, why did you go to school for what you went to school for? You know, why did you take this job versus a different job? Um, it can be any kind of mushy answers, and, but there's just an for better or worse, no substitute for time and just being together one-on-one, -on -one, honestly, um, or at least in very small groups and understanding people's motivation. Because at work, people are very circumspect because they don't, a lot of fear at work. There's not a lot of trust typically. Um, you know, there's other settings like a church, I'm in a small group with seven or eight guys and that's incredibly vulnerable and you just say exactly what's going on and what's your motivation are. And, your concerns are that doesn't happen and it shouldn't you know there's limits to to what you should be sharing at work um but yeah no substitute for time and just getting to know people gotcha thank you yeah my pleasure well i want to um i guess um i should ask jeff if you have any questions for us <laughs> before we close. Yeah, I wish I was there because we used to do this in the farmer school and then we'd go to dinner or, you know, have a chance to mingle and chat. I remember once at Louise's house. And um, so that's a great, like I said, that's kind of the best place to ask questions and understand 
where you're going and what your interests are. Um, but it's hard to do that over Zoom. So I, I, I don't think I do have any questions for you. Well, I do want to congratulate you again. I know you're almost to the end of this project as you launch it uh, today. That's great. And I also know you got finals coming up and then um, figuring out your summers and, uh, and all that good stuff. So um, I wish you the best. I appreciate the chance to get that glimpse inside of your work. Like I said, it's really good work, really thought provoking. Um, and as you move forward with it and post it and kind of shape your website, I would, would ask you to think about um, the framing of it, which is not changing content. It's just thinking in terms of instead uh, moving away from kind of a passive, this is how we see the future. Um, to this is just, it can be, think about personalizing it. You know, think about this is what I want. This is what I care about. I care about diversity and inclusion. And I care about accessibility, <laughs> things like that, that you have in there. And sort of bring, bring yourself to the, to the stories as much as you can. Um, which is just a small tweak, honestly. It's a few words, uh, maybe introducing some of the paragraphs, food for thought. But I love the work. I loved learning from it. I thought that was great. So thank you all for that. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to be on campus again. So hopefully I'll meet many of you uh, in the fall, if not sooner. Well, here's a promise. We're going to extend an invitation to you when, you know, when everything's safer and we'll all get together and... Um, really get a chance to, to know one another. Wonderful. In a way that's um, not quite possible, but we deeply appreciate you being with us. And I just want to um, reinforce what Jeff said. I think um, each and every one of you, uh, 2040 is going to be a time that's maybe a little different for Jeff and I than it's going to be for you. <laughs> but we, um, I, I just couldn't uh, agree more that thinking about how does this really pertain to you and kind of opening your sense of wonder or being curious or meeting really different people than you normally hang out with that you can do every day that are going to build um, your resiliency and all these wonderful things that'll make you open to however 2040 turns out and make it, you know, I think for some of us that are of a slightly different age than you, um, we have a lot of faith in you making, you know, it sounds corny, but we really mean it, like the world a better place. So thanks to all of you. We greatly appreciate it. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you, folks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bye. Jeff. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay.